Good morning. Our service of morning prayer begins on page 79 in your prayer book. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness because we have rebelled against him and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God by following his laws which he set before us. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory, Glory to, to the, the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with songs. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth and the height of the hills are his also. The sea is his what he made it, and his hands have more than the twilight. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee, and kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture. The sheep of his hand, all oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. The psalm appointed for this morning is Psalm 19. Kaylee and Arendt, appearing on page 606 of the Book of Common Prayer. We will recite Psalm 19 responsibly by half verse. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. One day tells his tale to another, and one night imparts knowledge to another. Although they have no words or language, and their voices are not heard, their sound has gone out into all lands, and their message to the ends of the world. In the deep has he set a pavilion for the sun. It comes forth like a bridegroom out of his chamber, it rejoices like a champion to run its course. It goes forth from the uttermost edge of 
the heavens and runs about to the end of it again. Nothing is hidden from its burning heat. The law of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the innocent. The statutes of the Lord are just and rejoice the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear and gives light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold more than much fine gold sweeter far than honey than honey in the comb by them also is your servant enlightened and in keeping them there is great reward who can tell how often he offends cleanse me from my secret faults above all keep your servant from presumptuous sins let them not get dominion over me then shall I be whole and sound and innocent of a great offense. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Glory, Glory to, to the, the Father, Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, Spirit as, as it was in the beginning, beginning is now, and will be forever. forever. Amen. Amen. Exodus chapter 20 verses 1 through 17. God spoke all these words to Moses on Mount Sinai. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of their parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall do no work. You, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and, is all, and all that is in them, but rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave, or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh, to save me, try. 
trusting him I shall not fear For the Lord defends and shields me And his saving help is near So rejoice as you the water From salvation's living spring In the day of your deliverance Thank the Lord his mercy Make his deeds known to the peoples, tell out his exalted name. Praise the Lord who has done great things, all his works his might proclaim. Zion, lift your voice and sing, for with you has come to dwell. The second lesson this morning is a reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. A message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified. A stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. 
Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking at the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The gospel of the Lord. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. This verse from the ending of today's psalm, Psalm 19, is often prayed by preachers when beginning a sermon. It is a fitting way to begin a homily and reflects one's desire to be fully present to God. I can't tell you how many times I have begun a sermon exactly like this, but it's often. For me, it expresses my hope that I, as a preacher, will be a conduit to others so others will hear God's liberating, life-giving, and loving word. When seen in the context of Psalm 19, this prayer takes on a more urgent meaning, though. The psalm begins with a hymn to creation, God's first revelation to us of the wonder, beauty, and harmony of life. Then the psalmist lifts up God's revelation of love for humankind through the giving of the law. The law of the Lord is perfect, and revives the soul. The statutes of the Lord are just and rejoice the heart. But then comes the rub. The psalmist asks, who can tell how often he offends? Cleanse me from my secret faults. Here is the reason for our prayer. It is an acknowledgement of the many times and ways in which we have chosen to live by our own desires rather than follow God's lead. The first lesson from Exodus is an account of God's giving of the Ten Commandments to Moses on Mount Sinai. In today's popular religious consciousness, I dare say the Ten Commandments are perceived as weighty burdens placed on personal behavior. While few of us can name all 10 of the commandments, most of us are convinced that at the center of each one is a finger wagging thou shalt not. Thomas Long offers a much more positive spin of reminding us of the context of the Decalogue. He writes, understanding the Decalogue as a set of burdens overlooks something essential, namely that they are not prefaced by an order, here are 10 rules, obey them, but instead by a breathtaking announcement of freedom. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. Long goes on to say, we will probably always refer to them as the Ten Commandments, but we can also think of them as descriptions of the life that prevails in the zone of God's liberation. 
I think that the reason the psalmist is able to say the law of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul is because he sees God's law as a gift that in the words of a tag phrase of our diocese invites us to love God, love your neighbor, change the world. Seen in this light, the commandments are not a limit on individual freedom, but a charter document for living out another prayer we frequently say, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Unfortunately, at the heart of our human nature is a tendency to subvert God's law into a system by which we elevate ourselves over others watering down spiritual life to living by the letter rather than the spirit of the law. In our gospel reading, we heard a story in which Jesus, at the outset of his ministry, challenged the purity system that was reflected by temple worship. Jesus's cleansing of the temple is recorded in all four gospels, coming in the climactic last week of his life in Matthew, Mark, and Luke's accounts, seen as the final confrontation leading to his crucifixion. However, John's gospel, which we read today, places this story in chapter two, at the very beginning of Jesus's ministry. For John, Jesus' actions in the temple pointed to the heart of who Jesus is and what he had come to do. Following the account of his first miracle, turning water into wine at a wedding in Galilee, we see that Jesus' ministry is all about living by the spirit of the law. Let's back up and recall that story of turning the water into wine recorded in the beginning of John 2. You may recall that Mary, Jesus' mother, begged him to do something when it became apparent that they, the hosts had run out of wine. John then noted that Jesus saw six stone jars that were used for rites of purification. He told the steward to fill all six with water and then turn the purification water into the best tasting wine one could want. A distinguishing feature of Judaism in Jesus' day was an elaborate system of purification. Women were impure seven days after the birth of a son. 14 days after the birth of a daughter. Dead bodies were impure. Lepers, you may recall, were impure. Certain foods were impure, and almost anything sexual was impure. To quote Marcus Borg, the effect of the purity system was to create a world with sharp social boundaries between pure and impure, righteous and sinner, whole and not whole, male and female, rich and poor, Jew and Gentile. Changing water into wine was much more than saving the wedding feast. It was an announcement that in Jesus, God is breaking down barriers. It was a different way of seeing the world and God's presence in it, seeing that Jesus came to give life in abundance. It's no accident that the story of Jesus cleansing the temple comes on the heels of the miracle of water into wine because the temple had become the heart of the purity system. The animals sold there were for sacrifice. The money changers were an essential part of the system. Roman coins were considered impure because they bore the emperor's image. So the money changers converted them into pure tokens, which one could use to purchase whatever animal one could afford to sacrifice to God. 
Let me interject here and make sure you don't come away with the wrong perception that Jesus was opposed to Judaism. Jesus was deeply Jewish, shaped by the Torah, committed to teaching in the synagogue. His parents brought him to the temple as an infant to make their sacrifice after Mary was no longer impure. And he came as a child to school the teachers of the temple with his precocious wisdom. Jesus was not the first Jew to cry out against abusive temple practices. The prophet Micah, centuries earlier, cried out against those who followed the letter of the law at the expense of compassion, asking, will God be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of oil? God has told you, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. And the prophet Amos declared, even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offers, I will not accept them. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. And Jeremiah stood at the gate of the temple in obedience to God's command and said, hear the words of the Lord, do not trust in these deceptive words. This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, but act justly. Do not oppress the alien, the orphan, and the widow. Do not go after other gods. Then I will dwell with you in this place. In the tradition of the prophets, Jesus chose compassion over purity time and time again, longing to draw people back to the heart of God, to remembering God being the one who is the Lord who brought them out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. The point of the commandments to love God and one's neighbor is to live grounded in a loving relationship. Remember, your worth does not come from meeting any human standards of purity, but only from recognizing that you are God's beloved child, chosen and precious to him. In throwing out the money changers and those who provided animals for sacrifice, Jesus declared that he is fulfilling the spirit of Torah and the commandments. When asked for a sign by which he does those things, Jesus declared the temple system of approaching God through sacrifice to atone for sins is no longer necessary. He himself embodied the temple's highest principle of compassion, even at the price of laying down his own life for us. Although they must have been scared and confused at the time, after his resurrection, the disciples remembered Jesus predicted that he would be raised after three days. God's love, seen most clearly in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, can never be overcome, not even by death. The deep, disruptive compassion of God for every living thing will never fail to overcome death, despite our human fallibility and willfulness that often leads us away from God. The good news we hear is that in Jesus, we have a way back to God. We no longer need to fear God's wrath, but can live by the indwelling of his spirit that calls us to grow into the fullness of God's love and peace. Among the many challenges the COVID-19 pandemic has brought into our lives, is a change in how we define and do church. What is church these days? Is it the Sunday service we now watch on YouTube? 
Is it our gathering on Thursdays via Zoom for evening prayer or Sunday family worship? Is it private devotional time in our study or maybe on a walk in nature? Whatever it is, it is a disruption of everything we used to take for granted about church. For better or for worse, COVID-19 has challenged us to see church differently. I know from the few brief encounters I have had already with people here at St. Christopher's that this new way of doing church is not terribly satisfying can even be a cause for lament, even as we are thankful for the technology that enables us to connect beyond the physical distancing we do in the name of caring for one another. I'm sure every one of us has prayed for that day to come when we can get back together in this place like we used to do. But in our grief and longing, I wonder if we might also consider that God may be calling us to reimagine, evolve, and grow on our journey of faith. Perhaps this story of Jesus interrupting business as usual in the temple is a hidden invitation to us to see that in the midst of this pandemic, God may be opening us and equipping us to go deeper in our faith walk. Whenever the pandemic winds down, our communities open up and we find ourselves free to return to business as usual. I hope we won't. Not if business as usual is characterized by comfortable piety that limits our circle of concern to only those who act, pray, and live like we do. I hope we will remember Jesus' disruption of temple practices that limited faith to a matter of personal piety that sought to please God by following the letter of the law. Instead, I pray that we will choose to follow where Jesus leads, living our lives sacrificially as he did, so that all may know there is a place for them at God's table. May our prayer and our lives embody the spirit of the law as we renew our commitment to love God, love our neighbor, and change the world. Amen. Standing, let us affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. It, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord, 
and grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let your people sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. For only in you can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under your care. And guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon earth. Your saving health among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten. Nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God. And sustain us with your Holy Spirit. Almighty God, you know that we have no power in ourselves to help ourselves. Keep us both outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls, that we may be defended from all adversities which may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts which may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. O God, the King Eternal, whose light divides the day from the night and turns the shadow of death into the morning, drive far from us all wrong desires, incline our hearts to keep your law, and guide our feet into the way of peace, that having done your will with cheerfulness during the day, we may, when night comes, rejoice to give you thanks through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified. Receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in their vocation and ministry they may truly and devoutly serve you through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. of the Book of Common Prayer. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. That we all may be one. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you. That your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. That they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. That there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those for whom continuing prayer has been requested, including Ron Mishko and family, Suzanne and family, Theodore DeBoz, Fran Myers and family, Sam Aubel, Dennis Kerr and family, Liz Russo, 
Roland de Vere II, Robert and Jean Wallace, Janet, Jody and Juan, Brian Flory, Andy and family, Jim Pender, and Jane. And for all who suffer from any grief or trouble, that they may be delivered from their distress, give to Alice and Bruce Bennett and Fran and Herb Cooper and all the departed eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. In our cycle of prayer, we pray for Dan and Rindy Collister, Sally Conley, Victoria, Chris, Oscar, Rhea, and Xanthra Connell, and Cindy Costello. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. by the river. My name is Richard Israel. I, am, I have the high privilege of serving as priest during the sabbatical of Mother Anne, who began her sabbatical this past Monday, and which will extend through the end of May. It's a great pleasure for me to be here with you and to get to know so many of you through our various Zoom connections for Bible study or book study, evening prayer, Stephen ministry, or many other ways in which we connect. Uh, I urge you to note that in the newsletter there is clear communication about how you can reach me by email if you have any particular needs, or just want to share a word of welcome. I would love to hear from any and all of you. Uh, if you have pastoral emergencies of any kind, you can notify the wardens and they will be in touch with me or you can call the church office. God bless you through this hour of worship and throughout your coming week. Please join in the general thanksgiving found on page 101. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings in this life but above all, for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all of our days. Through, Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make your, our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. 
fulfill now, O oh Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to him from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen.